Good morning. It's Friday, the 14th of July, and I'm Govind Raj Ethiraj coming to you from Mumbai, India's financial capital and of course most rocking city in the world. Our top reports and themes of the day are India's stock markets likely to take a break from their rapid rise. Foxconn and Vedanta have both said that they will find new partners after a 19.5 billion dollar semiconductor project came apart, but who could those be? The government says no need to revisit a 28% tax on online gambling. And hmm, Mohandas Pai and former State Bank Chairman Rajneesh Kumar join a Baiju advisory board. This is a core report with Govind Raj Atiraj. Markets hit a new peak and of course might be stretched now. We are still hitting new highs in the stock markets and thus we must record it at the core report. The BSE Sensex yesterday hit a new high of 66064 before dropping to a low of 65452 and ending at 65559. The Nifty 50 also hit a record high at 19,567 and eventually settled down with a small gain of about 29 points at 19,414. Now, the markets are looking strong, but as it usually happens, things start looking a little directionless at the top. The key driver so far, and projected ahead for that matter, has been earnings and higher margins in companies, benefiting from lower material costs or strong financial activity in the case of banks and non-bank institutions. But now, some leading brokerages and investment banks are saying that valuations are stretched at this point. Bloomberg is reporting that both Goldman Sachs and CLSA have warned that equities are looking expensive. Global funds may thus find better bargains in other emerging markets after having poured $13 billion into local stocks this year as domestic retail traders have turned net sellers. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, among others, have put out very long-term bullish reports just in the last two months on India. The valuation question does not, of course, suggest that their view has changed, but acknowledges the fact that even the best things must come at an affordable price. Rupal Agarwal, quantitative strategist at brokerage Sanford C. Bernstein, told Bloomberg that they don't think that markets are as attractive from a valuation standpoint as they were a quarter back. The sharp rise in the market has obviously surprised many but also moved indicators faster and further ahead than people expected. The MSCI India Index's 12-month forward earnings multiple has risen to nearly 21 times from 18.5 times just over three months ago, according to Bloomberg data. Now that, in a very general sense, is above its 10-year average and more than 50% higher than the valuation for the broader Asian gauge. According to Bloomberg, CLSA said late in June that valuations were exceedingly rich and analyst earnings expectations too optimistic. Goldman's analysts have also argued that valuations are expensive and that there would be consolidation in the third quarter. National Stock Exchange data shows that retail investors seem to be now feeling a little fatigued holding on to stock and are selling with net sales of almost $1.4 billion in May, according to Bloomberg again. Foxconn Vedanta, where will they go next? Days after Taiwanese electronics giant Foxconn and metals and minerals major Vedanta formally announced they were parting ways from a $19.5 billion semiconductor joint venture project and plant to come up in Gujarat, both have said they will go at it independently, with other partners of course. Now, neither of them has the technology to make semiconductors, though Foxconn, to be fair, is somewhere in the ecosystem of electronics manufacture. Remember, they are the guys who make iPhones for Apple in China and elsewhere. But the important thing to remember is that there are very few companies in the world who can provide the manufacturing capability. So it is quite likely that they both will reach out or woo or tie up with roughly a handful of possible names in the world, if someone else doesn't beat them to it first. Interestingly, a key component of a chip is design. And India already has the design capability, which by the way could be worth much more than 50% of the value of the chip. But that capability, while it sits in India, also resides within engineers who work for companies like maybe Texas Instruments, who answer to their parents mostly in the United States. There's nothing much you can do there except to poach, I would imagine, but that's a different discussion. 
Amongst the really big foundries, as they're called, for advanced nodes, which turn out the more sophisticated chips used in the latest iPhones and the like, TSMC of Taiwan, Samsung of Korea, and Intel of the United States don't look like they're coming to India. Also, India is now looking for manufacture of what is known as mature nodes, which are larger than 14 nanometers, as opposed to the more sophisticated ones from the companies I just referred to. There are also what are known as foundries, which only manufacture chips bases the spec that you give them. As this space hots up, it will be, of course, interesting to see who ties up with what and to produce what kind of chips. Now, to get a sense on what's at stake and who really are the likely partners, I reached out to Neil Shah, Vice President of CounterPoint Research, who's been kind enough to take us through the dynamics of electronics and semiconductor manufacture in the past year at the Core Report. And I began by asking him how many potential players or partners they really were and for whom. So it's a very specialized market and there are very few players in this particular segment because it's a high capex business, right? The barriers to entry to be a semiconductor fab is significant, right? It's billions of dollars of investment, years of IP. If you look at there are two types of players, pure play foundries and then there is IDMs, right? So pure play foundries are basically, especially which Fox and Vedanta are planning to, which is a matured nodes, which is above uh, 28 nanometer. So for that, there are very few players, like seven to eight IDMs and a couple of PRP players who are very active in matured markets. So the PRP players, PRP foundries are which are just doing more of EMS type activity where they just get the designs from the fabless and they manufacture the chips and give it back to those brands so they can sell the chips. So global foundries and UMC, global foundries from USA and UMC from uh, Taiwan. Those are the two major ones. Obviously, TSMC is as well playing in this, but they are more focused on advanced nodes. These are the two players uh, which are potential partners and being in Taiwan, the UMC, maybe they could work with Foxconn to license out the technology and build some of the particular fabrication unit in particular nodes, which will be aligning to Foxconn's ambitions of uh, being a more vertically integrated automotive player. So Anything which they can target in automotive sector and those players which Foxconn can partner. So in PR play, it could be UMC. If you look at IDMs, which is the second part. So IDM is integrated device manufacturer. So those are the players which uh, are mostly like ST Micro, Renesas, Infineon, NXP, uh, On Semi. These players are uh, designing their own chips. They're manufacturing their own chips in the fab. And also they are uh, selling those chips, right? So they are more integrated device manufacturers. So those players can license their technology or partner with either Vedanta or Foxconn individually, which should have been the right strategy from the start itself, right? Instead of two new players joining in together. Coming back to Foxconn, they could partner with someone like Infineon, which are also part of their MIH consortium, uh, which is one of the top chipset suppliers to automotive sector. And considering the ambitions which we talked about Foxconn has in automotive sector, I think UMC and Infineon could be good partners for Foxconn. When you come to Vedanta, since they are a pure greenfield player in chip manufacturing and even designing and selling, so they have acquired good executives as advisors and as CEOs, David Reed and others. So I think those guys have good experience working in IDM themselves. If they are looking for external, I would say anyone, if they can convince uh, from NXP or on semi or ST micro again to be a more uh, dedicated partner than being a third partner in a JV, right? So that could work. One other possible route for Vedanta would be, and it'd be great for India as well. For India has a homegrown fab. It's the only one fab we have, which is Semiconductor Laboratory, SCL in Mohali. So they are on 180 nanometer and they are doing specific chipsets for space and defense. And they're actually, that's why part of ISRO and government run. So if government can privatize them and merge with Vedanta and the billions of dollars that they're going to push for Vedanta and Foxconn, if they push on that, actually we could help scale SCL and Vedanta into a bigger fab, right? With more capacity. Obviously, they'll have to develop a Rolodex of customers in pipeline. That is another thing which they can do with all the executives they have experience working in the industry. 
So these are the options which I see for Vedanta. Right. And I think broadly, what you're also saying is that this is a very, very small and specialized market globally. So there is no surprise that anyone can spring beyond broadly the names that you've already mentioned. Exactly. Some players have already placed their bet and already planning in talks like, for example, Renaissance, which is another Japanese player. They have been talking with Tata, right? Tata Electronics. So Tata Electronics also wants to become a big player in this. And they are also very vertically integrated, right? From now, they're starting manufacture for Apple iPhones, right? So there are also ambitions in making chips, electronics, finished goods. And to add, they have Tata Motors also. So eventually, I think someone like Renaissance and Tata can come in. And then in future, what happens with Geo if they have ambitions as well to scale because they are also going to have a lot of product lines. Right. Last question. So, you know, there is the design of the chip and there is the manufacture. The design is also a critical part and uh, is more than 50% of the value of that chip. The design, a lot of it already happens in India. It's just that it's happening under the umbrella of a company that's domiciled overseas. Absolutely. That's a great point. As you said, the value is more than 50% and in some cases it is even 70% depending on the chips and the IP and software. And most of these companies, whether it's IDMs, all these IDMs, uh, international IDMs, or even the top advanced chipset manufacturers like NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, Intel, they have their largest R&D centers or the second largest in India. And they produce most of the designs for the chips and even software for those. Right, So India is already way ahead when it comes to designing chips, obviously, but as you said, it's under the umbrella of those international companies. But we already have that. So only piece missing of the puzzle is the manufacturing of those chips. Again, within the manufacturing, as we discussed, there are two parts. One is the back end and one is the front end. So back end is basically the packaging, uh, which Micron has put up a plant, ATMP, which is called assembly test packaging and OSATs, basically outsource packaging, semiconductor testing packaging. So backend is something which is a low-hanging opportunity for India. So if we can attract as many OSAT and ATMP players, we can take care of that. And the final frontier would be the front end, which is the actual wafer manufacturing the chips, which are etched onto the wafers. That is the front end process. So that is the most specialized part. And that is the most expensive anyways. Right. And that comes back to the same foundries that you spoke of and uh, the, the, the companies in Taiwan and America, right? Correct. Neil, thank you so much for joining us uh, once again and sharing your thoughts. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Prime Minister Modi lands in France. Prime Minister Modi has landed in France on a two-day visit during which he will hold wide-ranging talks with President Emmanuel Macron and join him for the French National Day or Bastille Day celebrations as the guest of honour. Like his earlier trip to the United States, this visit has strong economic overtones. What we already know is that India has approved the purchase of three Scorpion submarines and a naval fighter deal worth nearly $3.3 billion, according to reports, for around 26 Rafale marine fighters for the Indian Navy. There could be other business transactions and deals that could be the outcome of this meeting of Modi with his French counterpart, but that is something that we will know in a day or two. And hmm, Baiju's get some new directors. Just yesterday, the core report made a case for a truly independent board at EdTech company Baiju and also for the existing management to step back till things were fixed, so to speak. The company now says it has appointed Rajneesh Kumar, former chairman of the State Bank of India, as well as the current board chair of fintech company Bharat Pay and former Infosys CFO and venture capitalist Mohandas Pai to its board advisory committee. Earlier this month, Baiju CEO Baiju Ravindran told shareholders that they would set up a BAC or board advisory committee to guide and advise the edtech giant on the composition of its board and governance structure. Pai, interestingly, was apparently an early investor in Baiju's through his firm RN Capital, but they are understood to have divested most of their holding. While Rajneesh Kumar was embroiled in another startup mess at payments company Bharat Pay. Mr. Kumar said in a statement he was convinced of the efforts to correct the company's governance structure. Mohandas Pai said something similar. Now, neither of the two are on the actual board of the company, which is somewhat strange but maybe only to be expected. It also means that whatever they say or propose can be effectively ignored. Unless, of course, the appointments had the blessings, backing or more likely a gentle nudge from the government in some way, informally of course. 
I would think that both Mr. Kumar and Mr. Pai would have joined the advisory board to only in such circumstances or for lots of money, though I'm leaning towards the former and not the latter. There is at least one investigative arm of the government, the Enforcement Directorate, which has already visited the EdTech company's offices a few months ago. Another arm, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, is also believed to be looking into its books with loud hints that the matter could escalate to the serious fraud investigation office were some hanky-panky to be discovered. Now, the government has an avoidable headache in the Baiju's mess, given that its problems are entirely self-imposed and created, and has hurt the country's image of corporate governance in an area where much sound and light has been created and generated of its importance to the present and future. Of which there are many, of course, in the startup space, but this was the biggest, or still is. The other company that also faced a governance scrutiny is, of course, the Adani Group, with roughly the same outcome. More on this dilemma over the weekend. Now, speaking of the Adani Group, its flagship company, Adani Enterprises, has raised 1,250 crore rupees through a local currency bond sale. Now, this is the first such capital raise after the Hindenburg research came out in January this year, which led to the group's stock prices being hammered. More details of the bond issue and the subscription pattern were not available in the reports that I could see. Meanwhile, Yesterday, we discussed the 28% tax which the government has imposed on the online gaming industry, which does about a billion and a half worth of revenues. In a somewhat unusual, though welcome display of candidness, Sanjay Malhotra, a key government finance official and revenue secretary, told Reuters that the Indian government believes social as well as economic purpose will be served as people will indulge in more productive activities if revenues, that's of online gaming companies, fall due to the new 28% tax. The government via the Goods and Service Tax Council on Tuesday shocked the online gaming industry which has surged in popularity and attracted foreign investment. Executives have warned of job losses and reduced earnings, according to Reuters. If demand is highly elastic and revenues go down substantially, then a social purpose is at least served, said Malhotra. Interestingly, it was pointed out that the decision to impose this tax was taken after nearly two years of deliberation. A government panel had earlier raised concerns and proposed de-addiction measures such as periodic warnings and advisories during games. Malhotra said, Moral angle is certainly there when we are taxing online gaming at 28%. Lot of ministers at the GST Council were of the view that betting on online gaming is a social evil and should be discouraged. Investors in this sector include Tiger Global, Peak XV Partners, previously known as Sequoia Capital India, and TPG. Now, concerns about addiction have risen in line with the rapid rise of online gaming. Malhotra also rebuffed concerns that the tax would undermine foreign investment, triggering job losses. Employment and investments have to cater to the needs of society and what is good for the economy at large. No government would promote an industry only for the sake of employment and investment if the industry is not in public interest, he told writers. That's it from me for today. Have a great weekend. And before I go, Here's a reminder to tune in to the Core Report Weekend Edition. I speak with Rajesh Jain of Netcore Solutions, the man who could perhaps be called India's only successful dot-com entrepreneur, and ask him about his new book and theme, Profi Corns, as opposed to, obviously, Unicorns. Also check out our new series, Front Foot. We are launching with well-known sports journalist Ayaz Memon, where he brings out stories from the pitch, which have amazing parallels with the boardroom and specific, and the world of business in general. This was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter at www.thecore.in. That is www.thecore.in. Or follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook as well. Now, we would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant to you including our reporting on India's vibrant manufacturing sector. Write to us at feedback at the core.in. Thank you for listening.